Well, I wonder, is there, have you ever uh, just been in a room and somebody walks into the room and you experience the whole atmosphere of the room change or the whole mood of the room change? Or maybe, maybe it's someone you know, they're just going through it and they walk in the room and the mood shifts just towards empathy for that person. Or, you know, maybe it's a little bit of a downer or, or even, you know, maybe you remember goofing around as a kid in school you're sitting around in class doing stuff you shouldn't do. And then the teacher walks in and all of a sudden, oh, you're all perfect little angels, right? Or in the military, the right person walks in the room. You drop what you're doing. You stand at attention. You salute, right? The person's presence in the room changes something. When I was uh, in grade school, I was at St. John's uh, here in Sparta. But I think it was like seventh grade in us little seventh grade boys were super weird. And we spent more time in the bathroom during recess than actually going outside and playing uh, for whatever reason. That just like for this little segment of time in my uh, seventh grade year, we had this phase of like going and hanging out in the bathroom and goofing around and doing random stuff in there. Uh, But there was this one game we developed. It was like a contest between all of us. There's one stall in the bathroom and we would all take turns jumping up on the toilet seat and then vaulting over the stall, like, wall or whatever. And we would see who could do it the fastest, and it was like a little competition. We kept doing it. It was like multiple days in a row. We kept going in there and seeing who could do it the fastest. And I was always, like, the worst one for some reason, and it always made me really mad. And so there was one day where later in the day, after we all, you know, were in there goofing around at recess, I went back to the bathroom during class, and I was determined I was going to practice because the next time we go in there, I'm going to be the best one. So <laughs> I'm like, I'm in there by myself. I get up on the toilet seat, and it, just as I'm like climbing up over, vaulting in, the principal walks in and do this awkward like, and we lock eyes, and then he's like, what are you doing? And I was like, I don't know, and I jumped down, and I got out as quick as I could, and I just ran away, and I never did that again, and we basically just never did that ever again altogether as a group. All right, but he didn't even really have to say anything. But he walked in the room, and it was like, stop what you're doing. We're done with this. Right? But for, for some reason, there's so much power to people's presence. It completely dictates our behavior. It completely changes what we're willing to do or what we're not willing to do in any moment. Right? We react to people's presence in the room. And Consistent presence in our life has the ability to completely shape and transform who we actually are as people. The, the people we spend the most time with, it's, they, they shape us, they mold us. It, you start looking like the people you spend most of your time with. But just the reality is that there's, there really is impact and power to people's presence in your life. But there's no greater and more transformative and more impactful presence than the presence of God. That's what I want to talk about today is the importance of God's presence and becoming people of his presence. Not just people who know of God or know all the right answers, but people who know his presence, who have relationship with the living God, who are influenced by the presence of God. My hope is that the presence of God and relationship with the living God would be the most transformative, shaping, influential thing in our life. There's truly no presence more transformative than his presence. That's what we need. And I'm sure there's, I mean, maybe just by a show of hands, is there anyone in the room where your life was transformed by a moment in the presence of the living God, where your, your, the, the trajectory of your life was completely shifted? All right, we got people all over the room. I know I'm up here today because of a moment in the presence of God that I wasn't expecting, but God just had opportunity. There was space for me to be with him, and he spoke to me so clearly when I was a 13-year-old. He said, I'm calling you to be in ministry. I'm calling you to be a pastor. And that moment in the presence of God where he spoke completely shaped the rest of my life. And it continues to shape me today. It completely changed the trajectory of my life. The presence of God has the power to 
to truly change everything. But we're going we're gonna to read a, a story about a man in the Bible who had his life changed by a moment in the presence of God. And ultimately, it led to an entire people being transformed and changed. But it's a person I'm sure every single person in the room has heard of. But we're going to look at the life of Moses. If you want to turn to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, and we're going to verse, uh, read verses 1 through 12. But we all know Moses is one of the greatest leaders ever. He's one of the most popular people to ever live. Almost everyone knows the name Moses. People know he led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt to the promised land. He led them through the Red Sea. God used him in incredible and miraculous ways. God moved through Moses as a leader of his people. That's who we know Moses to be. That's how we remember him. This was not always Moses. He was not always this great leader. He was not always known for this. Starting in uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So pause right there. Moses is tending a flock outside of Midian, married to the daughter of Jethro. Moses, we all know, was in Egypt for some time. Moses in the little wicker basket down the river, sent to Egypt, and he's taken in by Pharaoh's family. He, he comes under the house of Pharaoh. And Moses' life is on track to be something noteworthy, probably to become a, a person of some power in Egypt, right? And he's a part of the most powerful family in all of Egypt. His life is set up looking pretty good. But he is an Israelite. That's who he is. That's his heritage. And one day, Moses, while he's in Egypt, he sees an Egyptian guard or soldier beating an Israelite slave. And Moses, out of reaction to that, eventually kills this Egyptian. He murders him. And when no one's looking, he buries him in the sand and leaves him there. But word gets around that Moses murdered an Egyptian. And so Moses flees Egypt. He flees to the countryside and he lands in Midian where he, where he meets Jethro and his daughter and he settles down there. He settles life there. And this is, this is where we find Moses here in verse 1, tending to a flock as a runaway, as a murderer, as a criminal fleeing from Egypt. And I can imagine Moses is probably thinking, all right, this is my life now. This is who I'm going to be. This is where I'm going to settle in. I'm going to have a, a great family. I'm going to be a father. But I'm, I can never go back to Egypt. I can imagine he's probably let go of any idea of being anything really that great or noteworthy. He, he's a criminal. He murdered someone. This is where we find Moses. But then there, while Moses is out on the mountainside, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight while the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. 
the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So Moses is probably thinking, oh, good. God, thank you. Yes, deliver the Israelites. You're hearing our cry. You've heard our prayer. Thank you, Lord. But then God says, so now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And Moses said, God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites? God, what are you thinking? I, I murdered someone there. I'm a criminal. I can't go back to Egypt. Why would you pick me? I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. I'm the last person that should be qualified to go do this. Who am I, God, that you would send me? But God says, I will be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. See, Moses had a moment with God, an encounter with the presence of God in such a radical and clear way that it completely changed the trajectory of his life. And now we know the rest of the story. Moses did go, and God used him to deliver the Israelites out of the hands of the Egyptians in miraculous ways. And time and time again, God shows up to deliver the Israelites, but he constantly uses Moses to work through, to move through. But never at any point was it about Moses' ability. Never at any point was it about if he had a clean slate or not. Never at any point was it about how good of a speaker he was. In fact, he was actually known as someone who was not good at speaking. This was never Moses' idea. It was actually probably the last thing on his mind was going back to Egypt, the last place he ever thought he would return. He goes back to Why? Because the presence of God shaped his life, changed the trajectory of his life. It moved him into his purpose. And that's what I want to talk about today. There is no presence more life-altering than the presence of God. But ultimately, I believe the only way we are capable of of living a life of purpose for his kingdom is if we are people of his presence, if we have a moment in his presence, if we live our life in his presence. This is the only way we're going to be capable of really being who he's called us to be, of really living this thing out. When we're in his presence, it will, it will take you places that you never thought you were capable of going. God will, will use you to do things you never thought you were capable of, of doing. And it doesn't matter how qualified you are, what your understanding is, or all, all your excuses of X, Y, and Z. He is able. God says, I will be with you. And with, Moses isn't the only person that we see this happen with. Paul, a murderer of Christians, has an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, changes everything, completely shifts the trajectory of his life. He goes and becomes the greatest missionary of all time, starts the early church. Peter, a denier of Jesus, has an encounter with the Holy Spirit in the upper room, all of a sudden goes from denying Jesus to boldly proclaiming the gospel until his death, until he's martyred. Abraham encounters God. God speaks to him clearly. God makes a covenant with Abraham. And Abraham, his, his lineage, Jesus comes from his lineage. The prophet Isaiah receives a vision from God. And he, Isaiah says, send me, God, I will go. God appears to him evidently, and Isaiah says, all right, God, I will go. Right? All, all the people that we look at in the Bible that are people we admire as heroes of our faith or people we we think, man, if only I could be used like that, if only I could see God move through me in that way, or people we look up to, there's a pattern with these people. They had a moment where they encountered the living God and they responded to what God said. None of these people were qualified None of these people were more 
were extra holy or just had such great understanding that that's why God chose them. At the end of the day, there are people that encountered the living God and just said yes to what he was calling them to. The difference between you and me, anyone in this room, and any of these people that we look up to or that we've seen God use is simply his presence. It's simply just a willingness to say yes to his voice in our life. If we want to be who God's called us to be, we want to live a life of purpose for him, we need to become people of his presence. We need to become desperate for his presence. We can't expect to live this life outside of his presence. We can't expect to just survive simply off of religious duty and doing all the right things and having all the right knowledge. We need to have a a relationship with the living God. We need to know his presence. And thankfully, God's presence is more accessible to us today than ever before. Because of Jesus, there is no boundary anymore between us and the presence of God. If you follow Jesus, God and all that he is is entirely accessible to you. There is no veil anymore. When Jesus died, the veil to the temple was torn. See, in the, in the Old Testament before Christ, God's presence was confined to physical spaces, and his spirit was limited to very specific time, or people for a very specific time. His spirit would come upon someone to be a prophet, to be his voice to the people. His spirit would come upon a king to lead his people. His spirit came upon Moses, but specifically to lead the Israelites. See, God would, his spirit would rest upon people, his presence would come upon people so that they could go to God on the behalf of everyone else. See, sin separates us from God. It's what God has been trying to solve this whole time. Because of sin, we can't be in his presence. We're not worthy of his presence. Sin is the thing that, that broke our connection to him. And, and it wasn't always the case that, that we could just freely enter his presence, freely be with him. There was a time when a priest needed to go to God on behalf of the people, and only very specific people were allowed to enter the place of his presence, where his presence was confined, the holy ground, the holy place. But because of Jesus, he paid the price for our sin. He's made a way for us to be in his presence. Jesus atoned for the sin that separates us from the presence of God. And the, when the veil tore in two, it was a sign that now my presence is going to inhabit my people. It's going to inhabit those who put their faith in my son, who died for them. And see, this is something that Moses yearned for. In Numbers chapter 11, verse 29 Moses says, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Moses is looking at these people that he's leading and he's saying, I wish, I, I yearn that everyone could experience the presence of God the way that I have. I wish that everyone could have the spirit of God. I wish that all could prophesy. He's probably thinking maybe the Israelites would actually listen. Maybe they would actually do the right thing if they, could, if they could encounter the presence of God the way that I, I can. In Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, Joel prophesies. He says, there will be a day afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. He's talking about the days that we are living in today. We're living in the fulfillment of Moses' desire that all would have the spirit of God. We're living in the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. There will be a day when God will pour out his spirit and his presence on all flesh. All who put faith in Jesus as their Messiah, God will pour out his spirit on you. His presence will become accessible to you. That's where we live today. So we have no excuse to not pursue the presence of God in our life, to not be people 
of his spirit, to not be people of his presence. It's completely accessible to those who are in Christ. So really, it's just up to us. Are we going to choose to prioritize the presence of God in our life or not? Are we going to choose to pursue the living God or not? That's the question that's posed to every single one of us every day. So how do we, we need to be in his presence. We need to encounter God. We need to, to become people of his presence. How do we do that? How do we make that a regular part of our life? Um, I just have three points today that I think can be just practical things that we can, you could do. Every single person in this room, you could do this to start pursuing the presence of God in your life, to start making time and space for God to be alive in your life, to not just be this distant idea or some creator of rules that I have to follow, but I'll never really know him. No, God is alive, and he wants you to know him. He wants you to be in his presence. So, number one, we need to remove all barriers to his presence. Like I just mentioned, what is the greatest barrier to the presence of God in our life? It's sin. It's the natural consequence of sin. It will constantly be trying to separate you from God. It will be pulling you away from his presence. So we need to eradicate sin from our life. And again, thankfully, because of Jesus, even though we sin, we can be forgiven. Our sin can be covered, and we can be brought back to a place of being righteous and being able to enter the presence of God. So it's it's not that, oh, I sinned, I'll never have, I broke it, I'll never have access to the presence of God again. But it's more this idea of every time I sin, it's still, sin is still working at breaking my relationship with God. And every time I, I sin, it's pulling me away from his presence. And so even if it's not that, oh, I have to be perfect to enter the presence of God, well, why would I tolerate the thing that is trying to pull me away from the presence of God? Why would I be okay with the thing that is seeking to destroy me? And we need to die to sin in our life. We need to die to a tolerance of sin in our life. We need to be so careful about what we accept and what we allow. Because even in the this compromise in the smallest area leads to another compromise and another compromise. And before we know it, all of a sudden my life is consumed by, by sin or just living however I want and the presence of God becomes non-existent in my life or my pursuit of the presence of God has become non-existent because I've constantly made decisions that have led me to sin or led me to the world. Now sin is becoming the, the greatest presence in my life. Sin is the thing that's shaping me and molding me instead of the presence of God. So we need to remove sin. But outside of sin, there's, there's other barriers and distractions to his presence that aren't necessarily sin. But we know scripture also talks about everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. There's some things. Do you have permission to do? Sure. Is it what's best? No. So there's some things we need to look at and say, what are the things that maybe aren't sin but are still distracting me from being a person of his presence? What is pulling me away from giving God my full attention, my undivided attention? Really obvious one is screens. Whether it's watching a movie, playing video games, or just scrolling on our phone for, you know, some of us, we could sit and scroll social media for three hours. We couldn't spend 30 minutes with God. We couldn't spend 30 minutes trying to pursue our creator. Right? You have, you have time in your day. It's just, do you have time for God in your day? So what is distracting your time? It could be anything. Screens is just an example. Maybe it's just any, any hobby, right? Things that in themselves are good and great. We should have hobbies in our life. But are they becoming a replacement for the presence of God in our life? Are they distracting us, pulling us away? Are they becoming a barrier? 
to the most important thing in our life, and that is being with our creator. So we need to remove all barriers to the presence of God. James chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Come near to God, and he will come near to you. So wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. James is calling us to take radical action against the thing that is separating you from him. Wash your hands, purify your hearts, and then come near to him because he will come near to you. Number two, when you've removed barriers, you need to make consistent time and space for his presence in your life and for you to be present with God. Every single one of us needs to ask ourselves, when can I meet with God every day? And where can I meet with God every single day? I want every one of us to answer that question. Where can I carve out time and space in my day every single day to meet with God, to be present with God, to give God chance to be God in my life? The reality is if we do not carve this out, if we are not intentional about this, it's just most days it's just not going to happen. Our days are busy. They fill up with lots of good things. Again, it's, it's just easy for that to fall on the back burner. But there's nothing more important than our relationship with God. And so we need to fight for that time. And I've, I've just found even personally, if I don't sit down and carve out in my schedule, when can I consistently go to be with God? My relationship with God just kind of takes a hit. It, it slides to the back burner. Even when I car- try to carve out that time, it can be difficult. right? But Jesus modeled this for us many times in Scripture. Luke chapter 6, verse 12, it says, He went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued to pray to God. Jesus, he's perfect, the Son of God. If anybody had connection with God, it's him. But Jesus, time and time again, prioritizes time with his father. He prioritizes the presence of God. All day long, he's busy. He's with people. He's, he's healing people. He's working miracles. He's teaching. There's crowds of people following him everywhere. He didn't have time and space during the day, so he stayed up all night to pray. He was willing to give up sleep if he had to, to be with his father. Jesus retreats to get away and be with God. And if Jesus prioritizes the presence of God, how much more do we need to prioritize it? See, I believe the reason why Jesus did this is because he, know, he knew he could not be who he had to be during the day if he had not spent time with his father. And Jesus says, I only do as I see the father do. I only act as the father leads. Jesus set this model of being with God, being in his presence, and then responding out of that place, moving out of first being led by the presence of God. And I think that's the same model we are called to follow. We are called to be people that respond to the presence of God. But we can't respond to his presence if we actually aren't ever present with him, if we don't have time for him. So we need to carve out that time. And we also just need to prioritize the opportunities that are already carved out for us. Something like, church on Sunday or Wednesday night or Bible studies throughout the week. There's opportunities that are available to you. So even in those, when you choose to show up to church, when you choose to um, show up to Bible studies or, or gather with other believers, it's a way that you can make space and time for God to be God in your life, for the presence of God to encounter you. But that should not be the primary substance of your relationship with God. Sunday morning, Wednesday night, these Bible studies, they're, they're meant to be an overflow of your time with God, your relationship with God, how God is real and alive in your life every single day of the week. It's meant to be a little bonus, a little cherry on top to your life with God. It's not meant to sustain you. And if you're expecting these opportunities to just be your full sustenance for your faith and your walk with God, you're going to find yourself being frustrated or probably not receiving what you need because you're expecting it to be something it's not really supposed to be. 
right? So prioritize the opportunities that are carved out, but you need to carve out opportunity in your daily life to be in the presence of God. We cannot afford to live without his presence. And the third thing is we just need to be people that are ready to say yes. If we are going to be people that are in his presence, then God is going to speak. If you draw near to him, he's going to draw near to you. He's going to show you things. He's going to convict you about sin in your life. You're going to be called to action. It's impossible to be in the presence of God and and be the same or not respond to him. So we need to be ready to say yes to his voice. We need to be ready to say yes to what he might call you to, even if it doesn't make sense, even if you have X, Y, and Z excuse. Are you someone who says yes to God when he does speak? But also the more that we say yes to God, the more we will say yes to God. We constantly shape our priorities and the greatest influence in our life by what we say yes to. Every single day we're faced with this series of choices. And really in any moment, we always have a choice. Am I going to to choose to live in my flesh? Am I going to do what my flesh is leading me to do? Am I going to choose something of this world? Or am I going to live and choose what God would, would call me to choose? At any moment, I could choose to scroll on my phone for an hour, or I could choose to give that hour to God. Right? We have choices. And so in those moments, do not take for granted or misjudge the importance of the decisions you make in the little decisions every single day. Because little choices to say yes to God in your daily life leads to one great big life that says yes to God and is full of living for him and going where he's calling you to go. We cannot underestimate the importance of saying yes to God in every opportunity that we possibly can. So we just need to be people who are going to commit to saying yes to God. And at the end of the day, that's, that's really all that God is asking us for. It's just people that would be available and then people that would say yes to him. Um, I'm going to call the worship team to come back up. And in a little bit, we're going to take time to pursue his presence again. Um, but again, I just truly believe that one moment in the presence of God could completely change everything for you. The presence of God is so capable of anything. But the only way for that to happen is if you are able to actually present yourself to him, if you actually give him space in your life. It's hard to hear him if you're not listening if you don't ever give him a chance. And can God encounter you even when you're being stubborn and going your own way? Of course, 100%. We see him do it. That's what we see in Scripture. God just completely interrupted someone's life and said, hey, you're, you're going this way now, right? Of course God can do it. But are we just going to sit and expect to just live our own way and hope that God interrupts us and has to grab us by the shirt and whip us the other way? Wouldn't it be better if We already presented ourselves to God and said, God, I'm ready to go where you're sending me. I want to be who you're calling me to be. I want your presence in my life. What could he do with that kind of person? What could he do with that kind of obedience, that kind of yes, that kind of willingness? I just want to encourage every single one of you this morning that the only qualifier you need to be who God's calling you to be, the only qualifier you need to live a life of significance for the kingdom of God is his presence in your life. It's just a heart that wants to say yes to him. That's all he's looking for. He's just looking for who will say, God, here I am. I will go. Here I am. I will do it. Here I am, God. I will say yes. That's all he really wants. Jesus' last words to his disciples these last words that are recorded. He says, now go into the world and create disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. He leaves them with a mission. He leaves them with purpose. 
He says, finish the work I've started. Following Jesus is beautiful. The forgiveness we receive, we receive life that we don't deserve. But it's also about receiving ultimate purpose for our life. There's no purpose greater than the purpose of living for his kingdom and seeing his will accomplished on earth. God's inviting you to be a part of his mission, to build his kingdom on earth, to lead those who don't know him to know him, to share the gospel. It's every single one of you. None of you are exempt from having purpose for the kingdom. Maybe some of you have already just written off, I could never be used by God. I could never be, do so and so, this or that. I could never be like so and so. I'm just not holy enough. I just don't have a good enough understanding about the Bible. I'm just, I'm struggling too much with this thing. There's nothing that God cannot do. There's no one that God could not use if he just has your yes. And I'm not saying every single one of you in this room is going to go be Moses and lead an entire people group to victory. God will, he'll tell you, he'll show you where you're going to go. He'll show you what you're going to do. If you're willing to say yes, it might be, hey, be faithful to your family. Be a good father. Raise kids that love Jesus with all their heart. Some of you, he might call. He might say, go, I'm sending you to go be a missionary, to share the gospel. For some of you, God might speak to you and say, hey, I'm calling you to reach that person in your workplace that you see every single day who's completely lost and broken. Some of you, God might just start speaking to you about how, what you need to move in your life so that he can become greater. He might speak to you about sin or, hey, this is the time and place that we can meet every day. I don't know, I don't know what it is. He's God, he knows. He's able. The point today is that if we're just where he is, he can take care of the rest. He's able to do the rest. His presence is sufficient. Where our understanding falls short, where our ability falls short, he is so sufficient. He is so able. Seek first his kingdom, his righteousness. Seek first God, and all these things will be given to you as well. We get so caught up in worrying about and trying to figure out who am I going to be in 10 years? What's the perfect route that I got to take to get to where I need to be? You know, our mind just spins with all the stuff we have to figure out. God is saying, I got it. Just put your energy and your effort into pursuing me and all these things will be taken care of. I'll show you. You can simply respond. I just feel like for some people specifically this morning, as I was, as I was praying um, yesterday, I felt like God just kind of gave me this picture that he wanted me to share. And it was a picture of a bunch of gears in, in like a clock. And none of them were moving. None of them were really working. And the person who had this clock was just frustrated. They're like, oh, I bought this clock and it's a piece of junk. It doesn't even work. You know, they, they felt like they had all the right pieces in place. All the things were there and it's not working. What am I supposed to do with it? But then someone added in the final gear and the whole thing started working. And it was, oh, it was just one piece that was missing. And I, I just felt like God was saying for, for some people today, the presence of God has just been the missing piece to your walk with him. You've been praying You've been trying to read your Bible or you've been going to church. You've been doing these things, but it's, you know, you feel like you just have to do it for your Christian duty or you've been trying to just go through the right steps. But God is saying, are you in my presence? If you become a person in my presence, then all of this stuff would start clicking. All these things would start moving together and start moving you to be really what I'm calling you to be. See, at the, end of the, at the end of the day, our time in the word, our prayers, going to church, they're ultimately supposed to be tools to move us to actually encounter the living God, to have a relationship 
with the living God. And so for some of you, maybe you're just feeling frustrated about your faith or you're just feeling like things aren't working, you're not seeing progress. Maybe for you, this is, this is that missing piece of the puzzle, a life built on the foundation of his presence. But the worship team's gonna lead us in a couple songs and I'll come back up to dismiss in a little bit, but, but before we dismiss, I just I want all of us to take a moment to just be fully present with God, to pursue his presence this morning. It can be as simple as just saying, God, here I am. Lord, would you just speak to me? And I, I really am truly believing that today God could speak something to you that completely transforms your life. I believe in God in a moment could speak something to you that transforms where your life is headed right now. You don't have to, you don't have to know anything. You don't have to figure anything out. You get to respond. All you got to do is just say, here I am, Lord. What would you say? And if, even if all that happens is you just take a moment to just be before God, how beautiful is that? There's no better place to be than just present before the God of the universe. Maybe today, is, it's as simple as, um, today is just going to be the start of being present before God every day. And I guarantee you, if we continue to make the presence of God a consistent priority in our life, he's going to begin to direct your life and speak to you and bring clarity. And you're going to live a life so full of just purpose and meaning for his kingdom.